Hungarian folk tales. The poor man and the dog. Once upon a time, there was a poor woman who lived together with her poor husband. They didn't have a thing in the world that they could call their own, except for a brood of children and a filthy little pig. Once they found themselves so utterly penniless that it well nigh drove them out of their wits. The woman said to the man, Listen, my husband, let's slaughter the pig. You take the pig fat to the town and sell it, and I'll cook a fine meal for the children. So they slaughtered the pig, but its fat was as thick as my little finger. So the man wrapped the pig fat into a little bundle, tied it to the end of a stick with a piece of twine, and set out to the town to sell it. He walked over hill and dale, until suddenly a dog sprang out of a ditch and started snapping at his heels. Woof, 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 woof. Hey, you mongrel, leave me be. Don't hold me up. I'm going to the city to sell this pig fat. I want to make a little money. Woof, 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 woof. What's that? What's that you say? You want to buy the pig fat? Well, I'll sell it to you, but will you pay for it? Woof, 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 woof. You'll pay for it in three weeks from now. That's a long time, but I myself am poor. I know what it is to be without money. Fine, it's yours. But three weeks from now, I'm coming back for the money. And if you don't pay, I'll beat you until you beg me for mercy. So the man took the bundle of pig fat from the stick. The dog grabbed it in his teeth, trotted back to the ditch and started to chomp and chew at it with great delight. When the poor man arrived home, his wife was waiting for him at the gate. Dear husband, did you bring home any money? Money? No, I have not brought home any money. Blessed Lord, what have you done with the pig fat? The pig fat? I sold it. Then tell me, to whom did you sell it? Who was the shameless wretch who didn't pay? I gave it to a dog. Blessed Lord, how can you have been such a fool as to give the pig fat to a dog? He told me he would pay for it in three weeks from now. Dear husband, tell me, how did you speak with a dog? Quite easily. I asked questions. He woofed. Dear husband, you are a fool. And from then on, the woman teased and taunted her husband, calling him a fool and a half-wit. But the man really was a little thick in the head, and he paid her no mind. The three weeks soon passed, and the man took his stick in his hand and set off to get the money he was owned. He went over hill and dale, and when he reached the spot where he had first seen the dog, the little mongrel leapt out of the ditch. It wagged its tail and barked at the man. Woof, woof! Woof, woof, woof! Woof, woof! So, little dog, here we are. I have come for the money. Woof, 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 woof! Enough of your woof, woofing. Give me the money. But the dog only woofs some more. Woof, 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 woof! The man became angry and he hit the dog with his stick so hard that the little dog yelped in pain, ran back into the ditch and started to dig. And it dug and it dug and it dug and lo and behold, a little barrel of money rolled out of the dirt. The man was overcome with joy. Goodness me! Forgive me if you can, little dog, for having struck you with my stick. I never imagined you were so wealthy. I'll take half the money to pay for the fat and half as interest. So then he took the little barrel under his arm and set off, proudly swaggering home. Once inside, he dumped the countless coins on the table. The children rushed in and started spinning and rolling the little coins. The man and the woman began to discuss all the things they would buy. They were overjoyed. But alas, the man in his joy could not keep his silence. He walked the length and breadth of the village and cried out at every gate, We're rich! We're rich! At last we're rich! His wife snapped at him, Foolish man, be quiet! 
Our relatives will hear that we have come into money, they will rush to our doorstep and beg us to give them some. But she cautioned him in vain, and the man continued to boast and brag. One day the woman said to her husband, Dear husband, it's cold and rainy. Go stand by the stove under the chimney where you can warm yourself. The chimney in the poor man's house opened up to the sky and when it rained, the water dripped down onto the coals. The woman went up to the attic with a bucket of water. There was still a bit of sausage left over from the pig. She threw it into the water and poured the whole bucket, sausage and all, down the chimney onto her husband's head. When he felt the little pieces of meat falling on his head, the man ran out of the house. Dear wife, did you see? It's raining sausage. I see, dear husband, I see. And do you know why it's raining sausage? It's raining sausage so that we may remember the time we suddenly found ourselves rich. If someone asks you when we came into a hoard of gold coins, you tell them it was the day that sausage rained down from the skies. Do you understand? I do, I do. Barely three days later, the judge arrived with two policemen. Show us the gold coins. We all know you recently came into a hoard of gold coins. Your Honour, gold coins? When did we ever have gold coins? Her foolish husband answered, Dear woman, have you forgotten? It was the day sausage rained down from the skies. Ah, yes, Your Honour, my husband is not quite right in the head. For never has sausage rained down from the skies, and never did he or I come into a hoard of gold coins. The judge and the policeman laughed heartedly, for the world is indeed full of fools. The poor man and his wife enjoyed their new riches and they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Silken Meadow Once upon a time there lived a great king and the king had a gallant handsome son but alas the king was always sad one day his son decided to ask him why he was always so sad and his father the king replied I see, my son, that you are a valiant man of courage and skill, for you triumph over the finest swordsmen and you fell the most ferocious beasts. But I can find no joy in this, for I have a close friend from whom six months ago I received a message. There is a beautiful silken meadow in the middle of the golden forest. My friend lives there. But the witches were so envious of his wondrous lands that they sent their minions to descend on him in their thousands. He has begged me to come to his aid, but as you see, I am old and I cannot go. Dear father, then I will go. I will wander the forest until I find your friend. Good, my son. May the Lord go with you. But listen closely to me. Behind the stables there is a large pit full of mud. There you will find the horse I rode in my youth. I urge you to take him as your mount. But first you must feed him. In the garden you will find 12 bundles of wood. Set them all aflame, and when they have burnt to cinders, take the horse from the pit and feed him, for he eats nothing but smouldering coals. So he set the wood aflame, and when it had burned to cinders, the prince took the horse from the mud pit and dragged him to the burning coals. 
Then the horse began to eat and grew visibly stronger and more vigorous. When he had finished, his coat glistened. The prince stood gaping in wonder, for he had noticed that the horse had six legs. His father spoke, Now, dear son, go up to the attic. There you will find shimmering swords, but among them you will see one covered with rust. Take it as yours. So the prince went up to the attic and brought down the rusty sword. He tried to draw it from its scabbard, but he was unable. No, son, that is not how you draw this sword. You tell it, sword, come forth from your scabbard. Hardly had the prince uttered these words and the sword flew from the scabbard, slicing the air with a swoosh. Now tell it, sword, come back to your scabbard. Hardly had the prince uttered these words and the sword was already back in its scabbard. Father and son embraced, both shedding tears, they bid farewell. The prince mounted the six-legged horse and the horse flew into the air, straight as an arrow. Then the horse slowed and began to descend into a beautiful forest filled with trees of gold. There the prince set off on foot. Soon he saw the edge of the silken meadow and in the middle of the meadow, a tent. And when he reached the tent, he saw a grey-haired man sleeping on a bed. In one of the corners of the tent there hung a curtain. Pulling the curtain aside, he saw a beautiful gold bed, and in it lay a maiden with golden hair and a golden dress. One of her legs and one of her arms were hanging off the side of the bed, and the prince stepped over to her, took her leg in his hand, and placed it gently back on the bed. The maiden was not asleep, but she watched him out of the corner of one eye. When the prince took her hand to place it on the bed, the maiden wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him. Let us be man and wife and live together forevermore. I know you are tired, so step back to the middle of the tent and sleep. The prince did as she asked and immediately fell into a deep slumber. As the prince fell asleep, the old man awoke and saw that there was a stranger in the tent. He drew his sword to fell the strange man, and as he was about to strike, it occurred to him to wonder, this man also has a sword. I myself was asleep when he entered. He could have slain me. I will not do him any harm. And when the young prince awoke from his slumber, the old man spoke, Boy, who are you? And what do you seek here? Unless I am mistaken, it is you that I seek. My father sent me to come to your aid. You are the son of my dear friend, the Red King? I am. It is good that you have come, for the witch's minions have been besieging me now for well over a year. And I see you have brought your father's sword, the companion to mine. For you should know, young prince, that no matter how many witches I slay with mine, 10,000 more come in their place. Do you see that huge mountain? An old witch lives in a cavern in the mountainside and she sends her minions in droves to attack me. Until we slay her, I will have no peace. They rose early the next day and as the sun rose, the witch's minions came in droves. And they poured down the mountainside like lava from a hot volcano. Then they drew their swords and slashed them to pieces. The Red Prince set off for the mountain. His saw sliced through the witches like a knife through warm butter. When they reached the hole in the mountainside, he decided to go in and see what lay inside. And what do you think he saw? In the middle of a huge cavern, a loom. And at the loom, an old woman, whose nose was so long and so crooked, it reached the ground. And the old witch pedaled so hard, that every time she lifted the shuttle, a hundred of her minions sprang forth, ordered them to attack the aged man. Go forth to the silken meadow, kill the old man. The prince leapt to the witch's side, took the dagger from his belt and thrust it into her heart. And what happened then? The huge mountain crumbled into dust and was scattered by the winds. In the space of a moment, it was as if it had never even been there. And what was there in its place? A beautiful silken meadow, 
The old man called his daughter forth and spoke, Good prince, I have no other child, only this one daughter. If you love her, I shall give you her hand in marriage, and with it, my entire kingdom. So the priest came, and the prince and the maiden were married in the silken meadow, and they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian folk tales. Sebastian, the Dragon Slayer. Once upon a time, there was a poor man. And the poor man had three sons. They were so poor that they could not afford to buy even the smallest morsel of food. So they decided to go and see the king and tell him of their misfortune. As they were ambling and rambling along their way, they saw an old shepherd grazing sheep on the hill. The eldest son said, Ah, if these sheep were mine, I would give one to every poor man. The old shepherd replied, Then from this moment on, you shall be the shepherd here, and the sheep shall be yours. The two other youths continued on their journey, and the old man went with them too. They reached a field of hawthorn. The second son said, If only there were vines in this field and not hawthorn, and if only the vines were mine, I would give a vine of plump grapes to every poor man. Then let the field be yours, said the old shepherd. And instead of a field of hawthorn, let it be a vineyard and the second son stayed to tend the vines. The third son continued on his journey with the old shepherd by his side, and soon they arrived at the banks of a broad river. The young man said, if only I were the ferryman here, I would take everyone to the far banks and ask not even for a penny. So the old shepherd agreed and continued on his way home alone. He ambled and rambled along, and soon his path took him winding back to where the first youth stood. You have so many fine sheep, my son, said the old man. Would you give me one? If I gave one of my sheep to everyone who happened by, in the end I would not have a single sheep to my name. The old man gave a wave of his hand, and suddenly the hill turned to stone. Then he continued on his way to meet the second son. What a lovely vineyard you have, dear boy. You could give me a vine or two. I will not give you a vine, not even a cluster of withered grapes. And before he could so much as cast a glance at his vines, the entire vineyard turned into a field of prickly hawthorn. The moon was high in the sky by the time the old shepherd reached the river, where he found the youngest son. He called out to the other side of the river, Come, come across the waters on the ferry. The wife of the ferryman was heavy with child, so the old man had to wait a while, but the youngest brother soon crossed the waters on the ferry. He did not ask as much as a single penny from the old man. Meanwhile, the baby was born, and they asked the old shepherd to be the godfather. By the time the baby had grown to be a boy of seven years old, he already seemed to be a lad of twenty. The old man said to him, Now, Sebastian, for this was his name, I will give you a sword, if you tell this sword, 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 sharp and true, mighty sword slice his head in two, and it will slice the head from the neck of any foe. The boy thanked the old man. And now, said the old man, go to see the king of the nearby lands, for they need as many shepherds there as there are days in the year. But do not ask a high wage, no more than 12 gold coins, 
a saddle and a horse. Play on the pipes and drive the flock into the rosemary forest and fear nothing. So he went to see the king of the nearby lands. Your majesty, do you have need of a shepherd in your kingdom? Indeed I do, said the king, and he took the boy into his service. Take the flocks out to graze and play the pipes as you watch over them, but do not go over the bridge, for if you do, you will surely meet your death. Sebastian took the flocks out to graze, playing on the pipes. The king watched him from the window. The boy was deep in a rosemary forest. He took off his cloak and spread it out at his feet. Then he took out his pipes and played on them. There was a stream nearby. And as the water rushed and gushed, suddenly a seven-headed dragon emerged from the water. And pray tell, what stray winds have brought you here? Do you seek the unhappy fate of the other shepherds who came here before you? Sebastian took his sword in hand and asked the dragon calmly, why? What fate befell them? Why, if you are so bold to ask, I will show you, roared the dragon, and he charged at the boy. Sebastian lifted the sword above his head and cried out, Sword, sword, sharp and true, mighty sword slice his head in two, and each of the seven heads of the dragon fell with a thud to the ground. The next day, when Sebastian was eating his breakfast, a nine-headed dragon emerged from the waters of the stream, but it fared no better than the seven-headed dragon before it. The king could not fathom what had happened, for until this Sebastian had come along, he had lost a shepherd every day of the year. I will pay it little mind, thought the king. We will wait and see what the fates have in store. Again Sebastian took the flocks out to graze, and he stopped to have a drink from the stream, when suddenly a twelve-headed dragon emerged from the waters. How dare you come to this place? Sebastian drew his sword. Sword, sword, sharp and true, mighty sword slice his head in two. When the dragon had but a single head remaining on its shoulders, he begged for mercy. Oh, Sebastian, Sebastian the dragon slayer, please leave me with this one head and I swear I will serve you. So Sebastian let the dragon keep the last of its twelve heads. Under the bridge there was an enormous cave, and the dragon took Sebastian to its mouth. Sebastian had never seen anything like it before. It was an empire bigger than the realm of the king. There Sebastian found the sheep and the shepherds that had been stolen by the dragons. Come with me to see the king, said Sebastian. And with that, he sliced the dragon's last head off. When he returned to the castle, the king soon realised he was a man of great courage and strength. He gave Sebastian his daughter's hand in marriage, and with it, half of his realm. I accept your daughter's hand in marriage, said Sebastian, but your lands you may keep, for I am a lord of a kingdom even finer than yours. They celebrated their wedding that very day, and they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales A talking vine, a smiling apple, and a jingling, tingling peach. Once upon a time, there lived a king who had three beautiful daughters. He was leaving for market one day when he asked his daughters, Tell me, what would you like me to bring you from the market? The eldest replied, Dear father, bring me a golden dress. The second daughter replied, Bring me a silver dress. And what shall I bring for you? The king asked his youngest daughter. Dear father, bring me a talking vine, a smiling apple, and a jingling, tingling peach. Hmm, the king shook his head. If such things are to be found in this world, 
I will bring them to you daughter dear. The king went to the market where he quickly found and purchased a golden dress for his eldest daughter, a silver dress for his middle daughter, but he simply could not find a talking vine, a smiling apple or a jingling, tingling peach. The king was downcast. It saddened him that he was unable to fulfill his most beloved daughter's wish. While he was brooding, his coach gave a sudden jolt and got stuck so deep in the mud that the horses could not pull it free. The king was furious because his trusty horses could race more quickly than the stars across the night sky. He sent to the village for help and when news spread that the king's coach was stuck in the mud, men, women and even small children came to lend a hand. To their shame, no one could push the king's coach free. All of a sudden, a pig appeared. Oink, Grant, oink, your highness. Give me your youngest daughter's hand and I will free you, your horses, your coach and everything. The king stood and stared in amazement, but whatever the king thought, he simply replied, we will shake on it, a king's hand and a pig's trotter. If you free me, I will give you my youngest daughter's hand. The pig didn't wait, didn't hesitate. He wedged his snout under the wheels, gave a shove and pushed the coach from the mud. The horses took off at a gallop and the king was back in his castle in a flash. And when he got home, he gave his eldest daughter the golden dress and his middle daughter the silver dress. But with great sadness, he said to his youngest daughter, My dear girl, my darling daughter, why didn't you ask for a dress too? For I failed to find a vine, a smiling apple, and a jingling, tingling peach. But hardly had he finished when he heard a gruff grunting outside. He looked out of the window and saw that the pig had even brought his wheelbarrow. Oink, Grant, oink, I've come for your daughter. Let her come down and I'll carry her off in my wheelbarrow. Stop there, thought the king. I'll send you a maiden. A peasant girl was quickly found, robed in the beautiful golden dress and sent out to meet the pig. Ah, but the pig was no fool. He said to the king, Oink, Grant, oink, this is not your daughter. The king began to regret that he had ever given his word to a filthy swine. And the princess? She sobbed and moaned so terribly that the whole palace shook. The king, shedding bitter tears of grief, told her, My dear daughter, I have promised you to the pig, so you must go. Then the king had an idea. He dressed his youngest daughter in dirty rags and sent her out to meet the pig. The pig, when he saw the princess, was beside himself with joy. He grabbed the girl, placed her in the wheelbarrow and carried her off, grunting and oinking all the way. Oink, grunt, oink. Don't cry, princess. You'll be happy with me. We'll soon be home. But the daughter only really began to sob when the pig came to a stop in front of a large sty, took her inside and sat her down on dirty straw. Oink, grunt, oink, this is my home, said the pig and he offered her some corn. Oink, grunt, oink, have a bite to eat, princess. But the princess simply sobbed and moaned. She cried and cried until she eventually fell into a deep, deep slumber. The princess slept and slept and she didn't wake until noon the next day. As the noon bell rang, she opened her eyes and, wonder of wonders, she was dazzled by a blinding light. She had lain down in a pigsty and now, lo and behold, she awoke in a palace. A host of maids hurried to her bedside. They brought her sumptuous robes and dressed her beautifully. Then they took her into the neighbouring room, where a handsome youth sat at a table laden with food. He said to her, Take a seat. Everything you see is yours. I too am yours, if you will have me. Who are you? What are you? The girl asked. I will tell you in good time. 
come now to the garden. He took her arm and they went into the garden. In the garden a fine vine leaned towards the maid and the clusters of grapes spoke. Pick us from the vine, princess. They walked on and soon she espied an apple tree, the little red apples on its boughs smiling beautifully. And as you see, we have smiling apples too, said the youth. They walked a little more. What is jingling and tingling so sweetly? The princess asked. Jingling, tingling peaches as you wished. Now will you stay and be my wife? The princess wrapped the youth in her arms. Yes, I will stay and be your loving wife for the rest of my life. But the youth then told her how he had once been a king, but a cruel witch had changed him into a lowly swine and put a curse on him. He would remain a pig until he found a maid who had wished for a talking vine, a smiling apple and a jingling, tingling peach. They sent word out that very day, inviting every member of his kingdom to the wedding. Their fabulous feast was indeed a wondrous sight to see, and they both lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Man with the Heart of Stone Once upon a time, in a distant land beyond the hills, there lived a poor old woman who had three handsome sons. One day the young men decided to set out in search of maidens from other lands to take as wives, for in their village they found not a single one to their liking. And as they rambled and rambled, their path took them through a vast forest, where they saw a small cottage and went inside. Blessings of the Lord on you, old man, said the youths. Would you give us lodging for the night? I will gladly give you lodging. So the young men stayed for the night, and in the morning the old man said, Good men, your path has brought you to me and when you return, it will bring you to my home again. I gave you shelter, and in return, I ask that you bring me a beautiful maiden whom I can take to be my wife. The three young men thought, a young maiden for this old man? The greybeard can barely hobble along. But they kept these thoughts to themselves and tried to hide their laughter. The three youths traveled to distant lands as they had planned and entered into the service of the king. The king had three beautiful, strong daughters. The youths served so well and fought so bravely that the king grew fond of them. So he gave them his daughters to be their wives. With great joy, the youths brought their wives home, but on their way, they had to cross through the vast forest where the old man lived. When they came to his cottage, they greeted him. Blessings of the Lord on you, old man. Blessings of the Lord on you. You were gone for a long time. I see you have found yourselves lovely wives. But where, pray tell, is my maiden to wed? The young men said, we did not bring you a maiden to wed. You did not bring me a maiden to wed? Then I will turn you all to stone and only one maiden will remain to be my wife. And as he spoke, the young men and the two girls turned to stone. One maiden remained, whom he kept by his side. She swept, cooked, and cried all day. One day, the old man was in very high spirits. The maiden said to him, Kind old man, why did you turn them to stone? Because my heart is made of stone too. And where is your stone heart? It is there, between the bedsheets. 
The old man left the cottage and went wandering in the forest. The maiden picked dozens of flowers and wove a beautiful garland, which she placed on the bed. In the evening, when the old man returned, he began to laugh and cackle. Why did you put that garland on the sheets? Because I wanted your stone heart to know joy, so I made a lovely garland. The old man laughed heartily. I can see you are a kind-hearted girl. You thought my stone heart was in the bed sheets, did you not? Ah, but it is not. Then tell me where it is, kind old man, the maiden pleaded. Listen closely. In the middle of the vast forest, there is a huge rock. And in the rock, there is a little bird. And my heart is in that little bird. If someone smashes the rock, catches the bird and takes from it my heart, then I will have my heart again. The girl sank into thought. Oh Lord, what man can do that? Many years passed and the poor old woman was still waiting for her three sons to return home. She thought surely they had died and another son was born to her and he grew up to a boy 12 years of age. Dear mother, he said one day, do I have neither brothers nor sisters? With great sorrow in her voice, the old woman told him that he had had three brothers and they had travelled to distant lands in search of maidens to marry, but they had never returned. Well, he said, prepare me for the trip and I will set out to find them. The poor woman gave her youngest son food for the trip and, weeping bitter tears, she bid him farewell. He set out on his way. And after he had travelled far, he sat down to eat and said, Anyone who is hungry, come join me. Suddenly a ram with tremendous horns on its head came out from the forest. You summoned me, young man. I am here. The young man treated the ram to a feast. And when they had eaten their fill, the ram said, Take a hair of mine, and should you find yourself in danger, I will come to your aid. The young man continued on his way and eventually sat down to eat once more and said, Is there anyone here? For I have a little food left. And a dove alighted on his shoulder. Come and eat with me. Take a feather of mine and should you find yourself in danger, I will come to your aid. The young man continued on his way and he eventually found himself at the cottage where the stone-hearted man lived. So he knocked on the door. But the man wasn't at home, only his wife. Good evening, and what brings you to this distant place, young man? The young man replied, I set out to see distant lands and you. Do you live alone in this little cottage? I am not alone, replied the maiden. An old man lives here too, but now he's wandering in the forest. And then the maiden spoke of her grief, of the men and the maidens turned to stone statues. And she also spoke of how the old man could get his heart back. The young man set out to find the great rock. And when he came upon it, he sighed. If only that battering ram were here, he would smash this rock for me. And magically the ram appeared and butted the rock once, twice with his tremendous horns and smashed it to pieces. Now all I need is the dove to catch the little bird, he sighed, and magically the dove alighted again on his shoulder and there and then it caught the little bird. The youth took it in his hand and returned to the cottage, and as he approached, the old man said to the maiden, Oh, my dear girl, I do not know what is happening to me, but I feel great warmth and my chest seems to beat again. And as the youth drew close to the cottage, the old man began to shed tears. Old man, I bring you back your heart. The old man put the heart of the little bird where his heart once had been, and it beat again as it had beaten before. Then the maiden spoke. Now, old man, bring those statues back to life. Let them know joy again. The old man brought them back to life. They paid him thanks, embraced one another, and set off homeward bound. They celebrated with a huge wedding feast and they all lived happily ever after.
Hungarian folk tales. Butcher boy George. Once upon a time, in a land far, far beyond the hills, there lived a youth named Butcher Boy George. You could travel the length and breadth of the land, visit seven villages, and never find his match. So strong was the boy that he needed no meat cleaver, he could kill a bull with his bare hands. One day, Butcher Boy George decided to bid farewell. So he said goodbye to his father and his mother, and he set out to see the world. He rambled and ambled across the lands, and on the seventh day of his journey, he arrived at the edge of a huge, dark forest. He looked to the left, he looked to the right, to see if perhaps he could espy the glow of a campfire. And indeed, he suddenly saw the shimmer of flames flickering between the trees. He set out towards the fire, but then thought better of it, for he feared that perhaps the fire had been lit by bandits. But hardly had he taken a step, and again the glow of the flames flickered in front of him. Again he turned to the left, he turned to the right, but no matter which way he turned, the shimmer of the campfire always followed his gaze. Oh, said Butcher Boy George, come what may, I will not turn away any more like a sheep trying to flee the wolves. And he went straight in the direction of the fire. When he reached the fire, he saw an old woman poking at its coals, trying to kindle their glow. He greeted her. Good evening, good woman. Good evening to you, my boy. What brings you to this distant forest? I'm searching for lodging, good woman. If only I could find a place to rest my head. I could give you a place to rest your head, but I must warn you that every night demons come to my house at the first stroke of midnight, and they bring grief to anyone they find. I do not fear, good woman. I only want a warm bed for the night. The rest is my concern. The old woman mumbled something to herself, blinked with her falcon-like eyes, led the boy to his room, made his bed, and left him there. The boy went to bed, and he soon fell asleep. But he did not sleep long. For at the first stroke of midnight, the demons began knocking at the doors and windows, making such a clatter that the whole house began to shake. Even Butcher Boy John felt frightened by this. Leaping from his bed, he took his stick in his hand and waited to see what would happen. Suddenly, the door gave a mighty creak, a tremendous chest flew into the room, a long walking stick popped out of the chest, wearing a red cap on its end, and lunged at Butcher Boy George. But Butcher Boy George knew a thing or two about demons. He knocked the red hat from the end of the walking stick, the hat rolled under the bed, and as all the demon's strength was held in this hat, the walking stick too quickly took refuge under the bed. So Butcher Boy George leapt out the door, turned to make the sign of the cross on it so that the demon would be trapped, and withdrew to hide out on the porch. Meanwhile, day was beginning to break outside. Cockerels had begun to crow, and the demons returned to their realm. As soon as the demons had departed, Butcher Boy George went into the old woman's kitchen. You cannot imagine the spectacle that awaited him there. The fire was blazing high, and its flames licked at the bottom of a soot-black cauldron of boiling tar. In front of the fireplace, a beautiful young maiden sat stirring the tar and sobbing to herself. Why are you crying, gentle maiden? Oh, my poor soul, the maiden replied. Alas, I have good reason to sob. I stir this boiling tar for my own weak body. And who told you to do this? asked Butcher Boy George. 
The old woman who took you in, she hired me as a cleaning girl, but she did not need a cleaning girl. In truth, she seeks to make a witch of me. But since I refuse to become a witch, she will burn my body to ashes and dust in this boiling tar. Fie, cried Butterboy George. I will put a stop to this. Do not fear, gentle maiden. Just keep stirring the tar and blowing the coals that they glow red hot beneath the cauldron, for the tar will be the witch's bath water, not yours. Then suddenly the old witch arrived and she asked the girl, Has the tar come to the boil? It has, old woman, it has. And you? Do you want to be a witch? I do not, answered the maiden. I ask you for a second time. Do you want to be a witch? I do not. I ask you for a third and last time. Do you want to be a witch? And I answer for the third time. I do not. Oh, you wretched maiden, into the cauldron with you. But Butcher Boy George had heard quite enough. He leapt out from behind the door, took the witch in his hands, spun her in the air and tossed her into the cauldron of boiling tar. In the blink of an eye, her body sizzled to ash. And now, gentle maiden, the world is ours, said Butcher Boy George. Come with me and we shall be man and wife forevermore. The girl wasted no more time for the brave butcher boy had won her heart. But before they departed, they went to the cellar where there was enough gold and silver for every village in the land. They gathered as much silver and gold as they could and left the rest that others might have some too. And together they lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales King Matthias and the Lamb with the Golden Fleece The King of Prussia went to see King Matthias. They greeted each other as old friends and the King of Prussia said, I heard that you have a lamb with a golden fleece. It is true, among the many sheep in my flocks, I have a lamb with a golden fleece and I have a shepherd who never tells a lie. To this the King of Prussia replied, I will prove to you that you are wrong for your shepherd does not always speak the truth. This I will not believe, said King Matthias, for my shepherd never lies. I will prove to you that he does, for I will trick him, so that he must. To this King Matthias replied, I am so certain of his honesty that I will give you half my kingdom if he lies. The King of Prussia replied, and I will give you half of mine if he does not. So they shook hands and bid each other good night and the King of Prussia returned to his inn. There he changed his clothes into peasant's rags and went to work in the fields. Meekly he greeted the shepherd and the shepherd replied, Welcome, the Lord's blessing be on you, my king. How do you know I am a king? The shepherd replied, I know from your words you are a king. 
To this, the King of Prussia replied, I will shower you in golden coins. I will give you six horses and the finest carriage if you give me the lamb with the golden fleece. Oh, I could not do that, not for all the gold in the world, for King Matthias would have me hanged. The King of Prussia promised him riches and jewels, but the shepherd did not give in. The King of Prussia returned to his inn, hanging his head in sorrow. His daughter saw this and said, Do not be sad, father. I will go myself, and I will take a coffer of gold coins and trick him myself. So the king's daughter took a coffer full of gold and a bottle of sweet wine with which to trick the shepherd. But the shepherd only answered that he had no need of money and King Matthias would surely hang him if he lost the lamb with the golden fleece. But the girl persisted and soon they had drunk the wine, though she had had to have the first sip to prove to him that she had not poisoned the wine. The shepherd was soon in such high spirits that he said he would give her the lamb with the golden fleece if she would spend the night with him. But he had no need of riches or gold, for he had riches enough. The girl did not hesitate, and she agreed to lie down with the shepherd. Then she said to him, Skin the lamb and eat its meat, for I have no need of it. I need only its fleece. Brimming with joy, the girl took the fleece back to her home. Her father was overjoyed that his daughter had managed to trick the shepherd. But morning came and the shepherd was very sad, for he did not know what to say to his king. And as he walked, he stuck his crook in a hole in the ground, hung his hat on its end, stepped back and greeted it as if it were the king. The king, or rather the shepherd's hat, asked, What news do you bring me from the fields? To this the shepherd replied, No news at all, except that the lamb with the golden fleece is gone, for it was eaten by a wolf. And the shepherd shook with fear. You lie, for the wolf would have eaten the rest of the flock as well. The shepherd took his crook under his arm and set off again towards the castle. He ambled and rambled along and he soon came across another hole in the ground, where he stuck his crook in the hole and hung his hat on the end and greeted the figure of the king. What news do you bring me from the fields? No news at all, except that the lamb with the golden fleece stumbled into the well and drowned. You lie, said the king, for the others would have drowned too. So the shepherd carried on until he found a third hole in the ground where he stuck his crook in the hole and hung his hat on the other end and for the third time he greeted the figure of the king. What news do you bring me from the fields? No news at all, except that the lamb with the golden fleece has been stolen. You lie, said the king, for the others would have been stolen too. So for the third time he took his crook from the ground and continued on his way to the castle of King Matthias. In the castle the king was seated at the table together with the king of Prussia and his daughter. The shepherd humbly approached and greeted the two kings and the girl. But the king of Prussia had already given King Matthias the fleece of the golden lamb and now all three were waiting to see if the shepherd would lie or tell the truth. For if he lied, King Matthias would lose half his kingdom. King Matthias asked, What news do you bring me from the fields? No news at all, except that I exchanged the lamb with the golden fleece for a beautiful black sheep. King Matthias was overjoyed, but he replied, Bring this black sheep to me. But the shepherd answered, She is sitting right there between the two kings. Well done, said King Matthias, for you have told no lies, and today I give you half of the lands belonging to the King of Prussia. And I shall give you my daughter's hand in marriage. 
said the King of Prussia, for you already know the taste of each other's lips. And this is how King Matthias Shepherd rose to become the King of Prussia. Hungarian Folk Tales The Lazy Boy Once upon a time, there was a penniless woman. Her husband had died, and all she had left was a lazy son. Everyone called him Lazy Jack because he hated to work. The whole year through, he did not a bit of work, simply crouched in the corner in the winter time and dawdled in the shade in the summer time. One day, the poor woman said to him, Dear son of mine, bring me a can of water from the mighty river so that I can wash your filthy shirts and trousers. The lad merely shrugged his shoulders I would gladly go if I weren't so very lazy. But the poor woman continued to plead. Come, my dear boy, if you go, fetch me some water so that I can wash. What will the world say? That I dress you in a dirty shirt and dirty trousers? And she kept pestering him until finally he grabbed a can and plodded along to the river. He dipped the can into the water and was bringing it home. Well, as it so happens, a little fish in the can began to speak. Listen, boy, set me free. Please pour me back into the mighty river. The boy replied, I would gladly pour you back, but I am too lazy to go back to the river. But the tiny fish beseeched him, and finally the lazy boy turned back and poured the little fish back into the water. Again the fish spoke, Thank you for your good deed, but I would like to repay your kindness. If ever there is anything you wish, simply say, Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. And no sooner had he spoken than he disappeared into the waters of the river. Lazy Jack took the water home, and barely had he put down the can when he put his hand on his belly and exclaimed, Mother, I'm hungry. If you are hungry, son, go where you might find something to eat. Suddenly Jack remembered the tiny fish and the promise it had made. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. Wine, meat and bread, a sumptuous dish. Hardly had he uttered the words when the table was creaking beneath the weight of food. Jack and his mother both ate their fill and were barely able to stand up from the bench. The poor woman began to do the washing up and Jack lay down in a cool spot behind the house. As he lay there, the king's daughter came strolling along. Ah, lazy Jack, you have time to be lazy even when others are at work. Lazy Jack got angry and retorted. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish. Make this girl meek and mild, pregnant with child. And miracle of miracles, wonder of wonders, the princess indeed became pregnant. Each day her belly grew a little bit bigger and nine months later she gave birth to a baby boy. The child was beautiful but in vain. The king was not pleased. He besieged his daughter with questions wanting desperately to know who the father was. But she swore on heaven and earth that never had she once passed a night with any man. But the boy must have a father. The earth yields no crop if nothing is sown. Wise men and sages advised the king to gather all the men in the kingdom, every last one, and make them stand in a line. 
Then they told him to put an apple in the child's hand and wait to see which man he gave it to, for that man must be the child's father. Well, if it's that simple, I will order this to be done. And all the men in the kingdom were ordered to assemble. First came the soldiers, then the reservists, then all the other men. In vain, in vain, the child didn't give the apple to anyone. What could be wrong, wondered the king. Could the wise men have been mistaken? But the wise men insisted they were not mistaken, but that the king had clearly failed to summon all the lads of the land. Again the men were counted, and they realised that they had failed to summon Lazy Jack. So the king sent his soldiers to fetch him that instant. But it took half a day for him to come, for Lazy Jack had been asleep in the attic, and waking him up proved quite a task. But when they pushed him in through the door, the small child immediately gave him the apple. And suddenly everything was clear. Lazy Jack was the father of the princess's little boy. The king, of course, had hoped that the father would be a prince or a great man and was not at all pleased at how things had turned out. You have brought shame upon my old head and you should be punished. So the king had his daughter, his grandson and Lazy Jack placed in a barrel and thrown into the river. The water carried them downstream. At first the princess sobbed and moaned, but soon she realised that although he was lazy, Jack was a good and honest lad. She said to him, Listen, Lazy Jack, this barrel is too small for the three of us. I would like a palace the likes of which I am accustomed to. Do something to get us out of this barrel. I would gladly do something, said Lazy Jack, but I am simply too lazy. But the princess continued to beseech him, and soon Jack grew tired of listening. Fish, fish, little fish, come grant me my wish, a palace tall with towering walls. He had barely finished his thought when the waters of the river suddenly threw the barrel to the banks, where it broke into pieces. Then they found themselves before the gates of a beautiful palace. Oh, how beautiful, said the princess. This must be our palace. It was indeed their palace, thanks to the tiny fish and his magic. They made it their home and lived together happily. Lazy Jack slept so much that unless the princess had woken him up, he might very well have grown roots. And that's the end of my tale about Lazy Jack. cooking pot. The cooking pot was bored with boiling and bubbling all day, so he began to complain to the walking stick. Oh, I can't bear to stay here anymore. I too long to leave this place, replied the walking stick. So let us set out together, my friend. Yes, let's, for the journey is always more pleasant when one has company. The pot and the walking stick set out to see the world. Neither of them was terribly clever. The pot, as of course you know, was empty inside, and the walking stick was hardly famous for his wit. 
At first, however, things looked promising. For when the pot was almost trampled on the path by the angry bull, the walking stick leapt up and began to whack the bull soundly on its backside. And while the walking stick was walloping the bull, the pot jumped into the river. Swim, swim, shouted the walking stick. I'll catch up with you soon. The walking stick soon grew bored with whacking the bull, so he too jumped into the water. He thumped his nose at the bull, who bellowed from the bank, but was unable to follow him. At the end of the village, the walking stick came across a pack of stray dogs. And when the dogs attacked, the cooking pot shouted, Whack them! Whack them, my friend! And the stick gave the dogs a sound beating. And as they continued on their way, they came across the terrible monster of the mines. The monster of the mines was terrified, for he had never seen a pot and a walking stick out for a stroll all on their own before. Horrors, what a fright! I'll grab my bag and take flight. And the monster of the mines fled and took shelter in the hollows of the cliff. And as he ran so quickly, he failed to notice that there was a hole in his bag and glittering gold coins were falling on the ground. But the pot and the walking stick noticed. Come, come, let's gather them up. The walking stick neither dillied nor dallied. He gathered up the coins and put them into the pot. The pot was brimming with gold. No one would have dared to call him empty-headed anymore. How fortunate we've been, they said to each other. And they began to weave the most elaborate plans, visions of wealth and grandeur for their future together. The pot thought to himself, I shall find someone who will wrap me in wire and make me immortal. They will cover me with wire, strong wire, all over, that I may never crack or break. And once I have ensured my immortality, I will ensure myself a life of leisure and comfort. I will bribe the cook to make sure I am always brimming over with stuffed cabbage. For the pot simply adored stuffed cabbage. Then the walking stick's vanity also rose to the fore. From now on, I will be a great lord. And after I have split the riches with my friend, I will find a skilled blacksmith and have a golden button made for my head. But then again, he thought after a moment, if I had all the gold we found to myself, I wouldn't have to content myself with a mere button. I could have my entire head covered in gold. Heavens, it would be simply splendid. I would be the most beautiful walking stick in the country. Maybe even the king would notice. Perhaps he would even want me to be his scepter. Or why should I not have all the gold? For am I not the stronger one? His head was teeming with cruel and murderous thoughts. And when the pot lay down his head to sleep at night, the walking stick snuck over to his side and delivered him a single lethal whack. And thus the pot's good fortune turned out to be deadly misfortune. The poor pot shattered fragments, clattered, clacked and cried out, Murderer! Murderer! But the walking stick barely noticed his cries, and he stuffed the golden coins in a sack and set off to find a blacksmith. God's blessings on you, good blacksmith. What have you bought me, honourable walking stick? A sack full of golden coins, blacksmith. Where did you get that, you rascal? I found it by the side of the road, said the walking stick, feigning a look of innocence. And what do you plan to do with all that money? You are but a mere walking stick. Good blacksmith, make me a golden knob for my head. The blacksmith took the golden coins, melted them, shaped them into a lovely knob, and soldered it on to the walking stick's head. There you are, he said to the walking stick. You may now set out to find yourself a wife. But his golden head, itself the fruit of his cruel act, would bring him no joy, only misfortune. His path took him deep into the forest, and Black Jack, the infamous bandit, spotted him. And the brigand spoke, 
The knob on that walking stick is made of gold, if I am not mistaken. Look, Matty, how shiny it is. Let's chase him down, grab him and take his golden knob. Stop, stop, they cried. But naturally, the walking stick did not stop, but ran from the bandits. He was gasping for breath when he reached the top of the high hill, and the bandits were still hot behind him. At the bottom of the tremendous chasm gaping below him flowed the waters of the mighty river. The walking stick had little choice but to jump into the waters below. He tried to summon his courage. I am, after all, a walking stick. I can swim. I am made of wood. I will reach the far bank. I am, after all, a walking stick. I can swim. I am made of wood. I will reach the far bank. And so he jumped into the waters. But lo, soon the waves were splashing over his head. He sank to the bottom, never again to rise to the surface. For the golden knob, the spoils of a cruel misdeed, pulled him into the depths, down, 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 to a watery grave. Hungarian Folk Tales Fisherman John By the banks of a mighty river stood a fisherman's hut and in that hut a fisherman lived together with his wife but alas they had no children. One moonlit night, the old man went down to the river and he cast his net. Suddenly he saw something approaching on the waters and it shined like a star. He watched as it neared him. And what did it turn out to be? A small coffin. And in the coffin, lay an infant child, fast asleep. He lifted the coffin from the waters, placed it in his boat, and took it home to his wife. Look what I caught in the river! And lo, he showed her the beautiful golden-haired child. We have no children of our own, he said. We are old, we will raise him, and then we will have someone to care for us. The old woman agreed. Time passed and the child began to go to school. The school teacher had a scrawny little horse. He said to John, for that was the boy's name, Little John, tell your father he could buy this horse. So John ran home full of excitement and told his father. Father, my school teacher has a horse for sale. Let's buy it. We don't need a horse, son. We have neither hay nor oats. How would we feed it? The boy said, it could graze in the woods by the banks of the river. So they bought the scrawny horse and the horse grazed in the woods by the banks of the river. One day, the horse spoke. Listen, John, at the edge of the village, there is a small house. In it, a worn saddle. Ask the owner to sell it. If he won't sell it, steal it. The owner gave John the saddle for he had no need of it and little John took it home and put it on the horse's back. Then the horse said, Go, John, to the edge of the village. There is an old bridle bit. Buy it, and if the owner will not sell it, steal it. But the owner would not sell the bit, so John stole it. Again the horse spoke, John, go to the village. There is an officer there who has a rusty sword, and if he will not give it to you, steal it. The soldier gave John the sword and told him, Polish it until it shines. Be a soldier. John returned home and again the horse spoke. Master Fisherman John, tell your father to buy you new clothes. The old man said, Son, 
I cannot buy you new clothes, for I have no money. But John insisted and told his father that he would pay for the clothes. So his father agreed and bought him new clothes. Again the horse spoke, My dear John, polish the harness, the bit and the sword, then clean the saddle and put it on my back. He continued, My dear Master John, you have a younger sister whom we shall bring back. John, however, insisted that he had no sister, the horse said. Yes, you do, at the edge of the neighbouring country. She is locked away and only rarely sees the sunlight. Climb on my back and we shall set off. They went to the edge of the neighbouring country and found the house where the girl was locked away. There the horse spoke. John, kick the door three times. If it doesn't open, strike it with your sword three times. If it still doesn't open, look around to see if you can see anything. And if you do see something, jump on my back. I see an old woman, said John. At that, the horse took off at a gallop, racing along as fast as thought. When they reached the banks of the river, the old woman appeared behind them on a long stick carrying a broom in her hand. And when the horse jumped to the far bank of the river, the old woman struck the surface of the water with such force that the waters parted. She cried out, Lucky for you that you got away! Then the old woman went back. The horse said to John, My dear Master Fisherman John, we will set off again tomorrow, but you must be very careful. The next day they set off again for the house at the edge of the neighbouring country. John kicked the door, then struck it so hard with the sword that it burst open. He grabbed the girl's arm, but he tore her blouse and was unable to pull her out. Again the old woman appeared on the stick with the broom in her hand. John said to his horse, The old woman is coming! And the horse raced homeward as fast as the winds of a storm. When he reached the river, he jumped to the far bank. The old woman lashed out at him with the broom and struck the horse's rump. But the horse was still able to leap to the far bank. The old woman cried out, If you ever return, I will have all of your teeth. The next day the horse said to John, Fisherman John, we won't go today, but tomorrow we shall. Today we must rest. Then he said, Dear Master, there is a tree in your father's garden with three apples on it. Pick them, put them in your pocket, and when we arrive at the house at the edge of the neighbouring country, throw one of them at the top of the door, one at the bottom of the door, and one at the middle of the door, but throw them so hard that you break the door down. So John did as he was told, and when they arrived at the house, he threw the apples at the top, the bottom, and the middle of the door, and the door broke down. The girl, Helen, stood in the doorway. John led her outside, and when they had left the house, John looked to see if he could see the old woman, and indeed, there she sat on her stick with her broom in her hand. John said to his horse, Oh, the old woman is coming, on a stick, carrying a broom in her hand. So John and Helen quickly mounted the horse, and the old woman chased them. Fisherman John, look behind us, because I feel that my rump is on fire. Johnny looked back and saw a cloud of dust far behind them. The horse flew onward. And when they reached the bank of the river, the old woman was still behind them, accompanied by 27 magic stallions. John's horse jumped to the far bank. The old woman and the 27 stallions tried to jump the river too, but they fell into its waters and drowned. And today they still lie somewhere beneath the waters of the river, if no one has fished them out. And so John rescued his sister Helen from captivity, and they both lived happily ever after. Hungarian folk tales. The miraculous 
bird. Once upon a time, in a distant land, where the curly-tailed pig digs at the soil with its snout, there lived a penniless man. He was so poor that his daily meal consisted of nothing more than the things he was able to gather together in the woods and the meadows. Once when he was trying to catch a bird for his lunch, he caught a very beautiful crow. The bird was as black as night, yet its feathers shone like the stars. The man took the crow home and his children were delighted. They put it in a cage and kept it and cared for it. The crow grew and grew and eventually it became so tame that it ate from their hands and hopped about the room. One day a wanderer passed by. He looked at the bird, took it in his hands and happened to look under its wings. Underneath its left wing was written that whoever ate of the bird's liver would become a king. Under its right wing was written that whoever ate of its heart would find three gold coins underneath his pillow every day. Now, who doesn't want to be a king? So the wanderer resolved not to rest until it had eaten the bird's liver. The poor man also saw the writing, but he did not know how to read. So he asked the wanderer what it said. Alas, nothing good, he said. This bird will die in two days. It would be better to kill it now. I happen to like the taste of crow, so if you roast it, I will give you 1,000 gold coins for the meat. So the wanderer placed the money on the table. The poor man regretted having to kill the poor animal, but he was in dire need of money. He didn't think much about it, but simply slayed the bird and roasted its meat. As the meat of the bird was roasting, the poor man left the kitchen for a moment. The children were playing around, and as they were hungry, they snatched the heart and the liver from the pan. When they placed the meat of the crow in front of the wanderer, surely enough, he could find neither the heart nor the liver. He was furious. Hey, you wretched man, where is its heart? Where is its liver? But neither heart nor liver were to be found. Well, not having found the heart, the wanderer realized that he would never become king. He jumped up, not having eaten a single bite, and left. The poor man despaired. He regretted all the money he had lost. So he told his sons that they should vanish from his sight and not return until they had gotten all the money back. How the two sons worried, but what could they have done? They set out to find the 1,000 pieces of gold. They ambled and rambled with heavy hearts until around sunset they arrived at the edge of a large forest. There they spent the night. When they awoke the next morning, a soldier was happening by. He gave them directions to the town and the two boys set off. The king, it turned out, had very recently died. When they arrived in the town, they saw a beautiful golden bench. The older boy sat down on it, and the younger lay down underneath it, and they both immediately fell asleep.
The next day they awoke to the sounds of a large crowd of people who had gathered around them and were cheering them enthusiastically. The people took the two boys to the palace. The one who had eaten the crow's liver was immediately chosen as king. As it so happens, according to the customs of the town, anyone who didn't know that the old king had died and sat down on the golden bench would be chosen as the new king. They had had a total of seven kings, each of whom had been chosen according to this custom. So this is how the older boy became king, and never again did either boy have cares or worries, for the older boy ruled as king, and the younger boy found three gold coins under his pillow every morning. Their father, in the meantime, deeply regretted having chased his sons away, so he set out to find them. By the time he reached the town, he had become so poor that he was forced to beg. He made his way to the palace, and the king immediately recognised him, and he ran to his younger brother. The younger son was also delighted, and they both embraced their father. Of course they were not angry with him, but they were a little ashamed that he looked so dishevelled. They took him to a cobbler and a tailor and had beautiful clothes and boots made for him. And they let him stay with them at their new palace. And together they lived happily ever after.